I want to welcome you to the 2014 UF Bergstrom Center Real Estate Trends and Strategies Conference. It's our largest effort, and we're excited about a lot of dimensions of it. We believe we've gathered an outstanding roster of presenters for the sessions ahead and an outstanding group of attendees. And we trust that you'll find that uh, one of the major benefits of being in here is, is to simply communicate with each other, as you are doing very well already. <clears throat> to that end, in a few moments, I'm going to draw your attention to a special little gadget we have for you, an app for your uh, smartphone. Uh, we'll get back to that in just a moment. But first, I think we need to give some uh, recognition to uh, some supporters of this uh, great event. First of all, I want to acknowledge the committee of our uh, advisory board that put our conference together. Uh, I won't list their names, they're in the program, but they did a splendid job and put a lot of time and effort into, uh, into preparing this. But in addition to that, we have a, a wonderful list of sponsors that we want to recognize who have uh, uh, endowed uh, this uh, conference. First of all, our platinum sponsor is BB&T. And among gold sponsors, we have Ackerman, ARA, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, the Bergstrom Investment Management, Duke Realty, Florida Trend, Jones Lang LaSalle, Ram Realty Services, Southeast Real Estate Business, and Wells Fargo. Reception sponsors, Covenant Capital Group, Gardner Brewer, Martinez, Monfort, PA, Starwood uh, Mortgage Capital. And our silver sponsors include BBX Capital, Center State Bank, Cushman and Wakefield, East Group Properties, Fidelity National Title Insurance, Hallmark Partners, HFF, Highwood Properties, Katz Baron Squatero Faust, MetLife Real Estate Investors, Panantoni Development Company, Regency Centers, and Tavistock Development. And a number, as you'll see in the program, a number of additional bronze sponsors are there as well. We've had wonderful support, which we deeply appreciate. Now, I want to draw your attention to a, um, uh, an app that is a part of the conference that I think you'll find quite interesting and we hope quite valuable. And this is a, called Feather. And uh, uh, here you see it. You have a little, little uh, uh, item that you can pick up at the registration uh, table that uh, tells you how to access it. And uh, uh, it, it basically, uh, for starters, will replace the need for business cards in many instances because you will find once you've linked to either uh, uh, Twitter or to uh, LinkedIn, you'll find that you have all the information, all the contact information on everybody who is a, a, a registered attendee of the conference. And you can make notes as you would on the back of your business card. You'll also find the entire agenda, all of the bios, and st steady, uh, an opportunity for steady communication regarding the conference. Now, I don't know up from down in this realm, so I can't tell you much more about it, but I'm assured that once you get into this, uh, you'll find it's an extremely valuable and interesting tool, and we hope uh, will enhance your conference uh, communication uh, very significantly. So give it a try and uh, let us know how it goes. I'd like now to introduce uh, an, another important member of uh, our program, and this is uh, Mr. Jeff Kahn. Uh, he's the founding partner of Hallmark Partners, some 31 years of mortgage banking and real estate and development experience, but we know him primarily as a longtime friend for many decades of the uh, programs at the University of Florida in real estate. And he is now serving uh, as chair of our advisory board, and uh, so I invite uh, Jeff to uh, come forward and uh, greet you. Thank you, Dr. Archer. Uh, on behalf of the entire Real Estate Advisory Board at the Bergstrom Center, I too would like to welcome 
each of you to the 2014 Trends and Strategies Conference. Uh, we have an outstanding group of speakers and panelists this uh, next two days. I think you're going to enjoy them, and we're anxious to begin, but prior to doing so, I want to take a brief moment and tell you a little bit about the advisory board. The impetus towards the board actually began back in 1987 when a group of alumni just interested in the university and real estate got together and had an informal board, if you will, supporting programs, reaching out to the students, embracing the academics, um, and continued with that until the year 2000 when the formal formation of the board commenced. <clears throat> the uh, membership has grown from back in 2000 with 35 members to this year today, 157 members. Interestingly enough, that growth has continued on an upward spiral, spiral right through the down cycle of 2008 through 2012. The membership of the board is comprised of individuals crossing all segments of the industry, uh, going from different company types, different professions, um, usually those that are in top positions with their firms. The board works to advance the quality and visibility of the university's real estate degree programs, primarily by providing a connection between the university and the real estate industry. Working with the center's staff and professors, we accomplish this in a number of ways, ranging from financial support, guest lecturing, participation in quarterly market surveys, mentorship with the students, and sponsoring this, our Trends and Strategies Conference. This year marks the 20th year that we've held the conference. Its purpose is to annually address those subjects considered relevant in today's times in the real estate industry. <clears throat> we have done so, and we feel, that we're moving the university well along the way to being one of the premier thought leaders in the country. The conference is a result of a year-long effort by the center staff and many of the board members. We've worked hard to, number one, identify relevant subject matters, number two, secure the speakers, number three, raise significant dollars as sponsors, and most importantly, number four, solicit your attendance at this conference. We appreciate your support. We're excited to commence the program. We hope every one of you finds it informative and beneficial. Thank you very much, and I'll turn it back over to Dr. Archer. Thank you, Jeff. It's my privilege to uh, help start this uh, program off with a bang. I get uh, to introduce to you somebody that many of you know of already, uh, Dr. Peter Lindman. For nearly 40 years, his unique blend of scholarly rigor and practical business uh, insight has won him accolades from around the world. Just a few, uh, Priya's prestigious Grass Camp Award for uh, Real Estate Research was granted to him. Wharton's Zell Lurie uh, Real Estate Center's Lifetime Achievement Award was given to him. Realtor Magazine called him one of the 25 most influential people in real estate. The New York Observer called him or counted him in the 100 most powerful people in New York real estate. And uh, he has a lifetime of achievements, really, even though he's still living. He has a lifetime of achievements uh, in, uh, in, in the academic realm. Master's and doctorate in economics from the University of Chicago under the tutelage of five Nobel uh, Prize uh, laureate uh, faculty. 33 years, he, was, he served on UF, or U of Chicago faculty and uh, then followed that with 33 years as one of the leading faculty members of the Wharton School and where he founded the Wharton Real Estate Department and directed the well-known Zur Arzell Lurie Real Estate Center. 
has lots of publications, some 80 academic articles, a very significant textbook in the field of finance and investment. And he has been sought far and wide by industry groups throughout the world uh, for his insights and perspectives. He's serving as board member, his advisor, and speaker. But enough, uh, let's let him tell us about the world. We welcome Peter Linneman. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Archer. I can still do that. You're impressed. <laughs> That's just to show I can still do that. Not as well as I used to, but it was a great pleasure to be here. Um, uh, you know, my friend Ron Twilliger, who you honored last year, is here. And, and I, it's nice to be in an audience like this because Ron went to Harvard Business School. And uh, did anybody else go to Harvard? See, it's nice because, see, Ron, I can talk normal speed and they'll understand. I don't have to slow it down like I did for you. So, so no, it's a pleasure to be here. You guys have done a tremendous job and where the program and where you've brought it, I have great respect for. So I'm going to talk about the U.S. economy a bit in the context of real estate. Um, and hopefully, I, I actually believe we're on the dawn of perhaps the greatest era of growth in the United States since after World War II. And I'm going to try to convince you of that. I hope I'm right. That would even be nicer than if I convince you. So. This chart, and by the way, you're welcome to distribute my charts to anybody who wants them, let me know. This in the red, which is a little harder to see in the black, excuse me, in the back, is the 40-year trend in real GDP. And all the 40-year trend, everything I'm going to do is round. It's 2% productivity growth of those people already here and 1% population growth. It's not rocket science, in other words. It's just two and one. And by the way, it wouldn't look different if I took the 30-year growth or the 50-year growth. It's two and one, up to rounding. Um, the yellow is actual real GDP. And you can see sometimes it's above trend and sometimes it's below trend. And this time, it's really below trend. So let me focus on the yellow. In fact, if I only did one chart, this would be the only chart I would do. Because I think this chart says almost everything about the US economy. Let's start off with the yellow. Real GDP is higher today than it ever has been in the history of the United States. And in fact, if you put up real GDP per capita, it is also higher than it has ever been in the history of the United States. So remember how good you felt in, say, late 2007? We're better off as a body than we were then. And yet none of you feel anywhere near as good as you did then. But that's an interesting understanding to have. And I'll give you some reasons why you don't. But I'll start with this chart saying, see the difference between the red, which is where every instinct tells you it should be, and the yellow, which is where it's at, it's $2 trillion. $2 trillion is roughly the size of the entire United Kingdom economy. Which is to say, yes, we're better than we've ever been in history, but we're every dollar spent on everything short, everything spent in the United Kingdom short of where, quote, we deserve to be. And that's why you feel miserable. That's why you feel disappointed. That's why you feel let down. And that's why anybody who built or expected on that trend to continue is struggling, even though growth is occurring, even though we're coming along. That gap is $2 trillion on a roughly $18 trillion GDP. Okay? Now, all this chart does is take the previous chart, and instead of showing it in absolutes, it's the percentage difference between the yellow and the red. That's all it is. is what is the percentage difference between the yellow and the red? If it's above the line, the economy is doing better than trend. If it's below the line, it's below trend. And what you can see, hopefully, are two phenomena, which is we've had big deviations above and below. You can see several deviations as large as 5 6% off. And by the way, that's when everybody was writing the economy 
is screwed. China's, Japan's going to rule the world and Germany's going to rule the world and we'll never produce anything here and Americans are idiots. And by the way, it's not like those are baseless claims. They just didn't turn out to be accurate. And by the way, you'll see we got five, six, seven, and even eight percent above trend. And you go back to see what people said then, and it was always the new norm, right? The new norm. We'll never revert back to trend. We're always going to stay perpetually above trend. And one thing this shows is kind of serious mean reversion. And all mean reversion here means is two percent productivity. 1% population, right? That's all it means, is that eventually we can do things better by about 2% a year, some years more, some years less, and we keep adding to the population. Now you'll notice the current deviation is the largest we've ever had. It's about 11, not quite 11% of GDP. I just have the feeling I don't know what has changed a general paradigm of 2% productivity and 1% population. Population is still growing roughly 1% a year. And I don't notably see people are stupider or less creative or less innovative than any of the last 40 years of my life. Now maybe you have better perceptions. So if I had to bet I'll bet on mean reversion. Now, I would have said that for the last two years and would have been wrong. The good news is I have a wife for 40 years who's gotten me used to being wrong. Okay? But having said that, you really have to believe something unique has happened to 2% productivity, 1% population for that to forever stay down. The other thing is if you go back and study where most experts have been most wrong, it's at the turning points. And the turning points have invariably been identified when nobody believes it can turn. That's the only predictor I've ever found. Find when basically everybody agrees it can't turn, that's when it's turned. In fact, it's probably turned already. So that, I will, how many believe we've turned? The answer is no one, therefore, that's my QED. It will revert, and soon. Now, let me go to, uh, this is the growth in population. This is the 1% side of it. It's, I rounded, right? It's really more like 93 basis points. And you can see that during the recession, as always happens, we dropped from about 93 to 95 basis points of population growth to 75 basis points of population growth. But last year we had 105 basis points of population growth. Namely, seems to be reverting. Most of the drop in population growth was the drop associated with immigrants. And why would you come if there are no jobs? And so is it a surprise as jobs tend to recur that you start seeing population growth again? Let me give you another kind of $2 trillion. Remember, that's the gap. That's the how do we make it up? And everything I'm going to do, I'm rounding. In a normal year, over the last 30 year, four, excuse me, 40 years, we build 1.2 million single family housing units. And that's to take account of the 1% population growth and floods, fires, hurricanes, destroying the existing housing, housing stock. Over the last decade, you can track out what we've done. So if every year of the last decade we'd have built 1.2 million homes, this would be flatlined at zero. This says how many more than the pace of 1.2 million a year are we building? So you can see that five years into the last decade, by the end of five years, we had built 2 million more, actually 2.2 million more homes in five years than you would expect. So five times 1.2 is 6, billion, 6 million, and we had built 8.3 
in the first five years. However, in the next five years, we so underproduced housing that for the decade as a total, instead of producing 12 million, we built 10.7 million homes. The last decade has not been a decade of overproduction of housing. It's been massive underproduction of housing. And when you just do the simple math of how much GDP is associated with a single family home being built, the number is four to five hundred billion dollars. Another way of saying, about a quarter of the two trillion shortfall that's evolved is nothing more than we haven't built houses. But we've added the population. We've had floods, fires, and hurricanes. And remember I alluded to after World War II, the interesting thing about the explosion that happened starting about 1948 economically is it had been the depressed decade from the Great Depression and World War II that had built pent up in almost everything. This is a huge pent up factor. Unless you think people aren't going to live in houses anymore. Or unless you said, yes, we underproduce single family housing, but we way overproduce multifamily housing, right? So if I told you we overproduce relative to the norm multifamily by a million three, you'd say, who cares? So let's look at the same thing for multifamily. And again, I'm going to round. By the way, the numbers are based on not rounded. But I'm rounding for this purpose. 400,000 a year multifamily units. That's to deal with population growth, floods, fires, and hurricanes. If we built 400,000 a year, it would be flat lined at zero. And you can see that through the first five years of the last decade, it drifted a little below zero, and then it exploded below zero. Such that over the last 10 years, instead of building 4 million multifamily units, we've only built 3 million multifamily housing units, but we've had population growth, floods, fires, hurricanes. So we're a million short on multi, which is about $250 billion of pent up economic activity. So between single and multi, 750 billion of the two trillion is explained simply by that sector. Just that simple sector. And my view is people are eventually going to want roofs. They may want them in different places. They may want them of different sizes, of different shapes, with different amenities. And when they do, you're going to unleash this tailwind. So when people say, well, how do we fill the gap? All we do is house our population and we'll fill the gap. Let's look at what happened to home prices. This is single family existing home prices in the United States. This starts in 1990. The yellow is what actually happened to the median single family home in the United States. The red is what would have happened if from its starting point it had gone up by CPI, just by inflation. And the green is, what if it had gone up by inflation plus 1% a year? By the way, that's essentially what history has done. Inflation plus 1%. And there, it's largely reflective of the quality creep. That slowly over time, the quality of housing is improving because the bad stuff's going down and new stuff's coming in better and there's a drip. And you can see it's slightly overshot the first five years of the decade. It only got above those trends by about, oh, I don't know, 35%. And then it actually undershot the other way. And since then has risen, but it's right in that comfort zone between inflation and inflation plus 1% per annum. Now, obviously, we track this on every market. So each market's a little different. The general picture is the same. Do you see where the home price picks up? See that point? You know when that pickup occurs? Exactly when that single family chart went from above the line of overproduction to below the line of underproduction. And while economics may not be perfect as a field of study, it says if you produce a lot, prices tend to fall. And if you produce a little, prices tend to rise. It is not interest rates that have driven the rise in home prices. It's been fundamental underproduction. How do you know it's not interest rates? 
If it had been interest rates, home prices would have risen five years ago. Right? One minute interest rates get slashed to nothing. Inter the, the home price continued to fall even though interest rates were down. It has to do with fundamental underproduction. Best single metric, better than the Michigan and the consumer board measures of consumer confidence, at least in my analysis, is real household net worth per capita, per household. Okay, you have to adjust for the fact there's more families. That's the yellow line. The red is a very simple trend just to help your eye. Good news is we're actually a little above trend. Good news is we're way up off the bottom. Those would suggest consumer confidence is rebounding, which it has. You know what the problem is? The problem is we're still $100,000 per household poor. $100,000 per household per household poor. Now you may say if you follow the Fed data, you'll see that net household wealth is at an all-time high. But that's before you adjust for population growth and inflation. And you had six years of population growth and six years of inflation. And when you adjust, you're $100,000 per household below where you were at the peak. Now I'm going to tell you an insight about people that I've seen. Everybody believes that they personally deserve the wealth they had in 2007. They just don't believe anybody else deserved it. Right? Your home was overvalued. Your stocks were overvalued. Not mine. Mine were perfect. So the dichotomy is, I still am $100,000 poorer than I used to be. Is it a surprise consumer confidence isn't back, even though my income is back? All right, My wealth is not back, but my income is. Now we're improving, and that's good. I'm going to go through five uncertainties that I think are keeping the, uh, six uncertainties that are holding the economy back. I'm somewhat in a minority. I've been consistent with this since September 2008. I'm going to keep saying it until it turns out to be true. Um, five uncertainties. This is an index put together by some economists at Stanford and the University of Chicago. And it's, we don't have time to go, but essentially it tries to pick up political uncertainty. Now, I think everybody in this room would say federal level political uncertainty has been higher in the last six years than normal. And in fact, this chart goes back to 1985 when they started. And you would see the last six years generally have run much higher than prior periods. And one thing I've learned about business and households is it hates uncertainty. Businesses and households can deal with bad laws. We know that. We, we, we just can't deal with, we don't know what the law is. That's very hard. And so hopefully this will begin to ebb. Hopefully we'll get some degree of certainty and people re, will act. Second, second uncertainty. Healthcare in this country accounts for 17% of GDP. It affects every human being in the United States. Is it surprising that if you tried a major reform of 17% of the economy that affected everybody, it would raise uncertainty? Right? Fair enough. And by the way, if it only deterred 10%, of 17%, it's 1.7% of the economy's activity is being dampened. Right? Just to kind of put it in context. Does anybody in this room or any room in America know will Obamacare work? No one knows. What will it cost? How will it be changed? How will it be handled administratively? You don't even know that for your own businesses. But you know what? In four or five years, or three years, and maybe even two years, you will know. You may like the answer or hate the answer, but you know what? You'll know the answer. And if you know the answer, you can at least deal with it. And hopefully this uncertainty will recede. Third uncertainty, financial market regulation. Basically every business and about two-thirds of the households of America rely on some variant of credit flow. Now imagine you reshaped 
the regulations. By the way, the regulatory pattern for the financial sector was absolute shit. That's a technical description. <laughs> Does anyone believe after Dodd-Frank it also won't be total shit? It'll just be different shit. Okay? And the problem is we don't know yet what it is. Only 40% of all the regulations mandated by Dodd-Frank have been written. If you're a financial institution, are you more concerned about running your business or protecting your franchise from a lobbying point of view? Would it surprise you to find out that the lobbying expenditures by the financial sector have never been higher than over the last four years? Their entire fate is in the balance. Does anybody know how Dodd-Frank will play out? What happens to Freddie and Fannie? And, and I teasingly say, something as simple as the Volcker Rule, which I imagine most of you, when you heard it proclaimed, said, yeah, that kind of makes sense. 834 pages later, they're still not done with finalizing what it means. 834 pages. And I have a phrase that when you're paying lawyers to read 834 pages instead of engineers to develop new products, it's not a period of growth. It's eating into that productivity. So this will recede because at some point we'll know what they're going to do with Fannie and Freddie. You know it's going to be dumb. Okay? That's a, that's a given. All we're talking about is which dumb are they going to choose? Okay? And if they just tell me which dumb rules we can go. Fourth uncertainty. This is the three years of federal spending. Some people, by the way, are doing this intellectually. Some are doing it viscerally. I'll show you the numbers. From 1954 to 1973, that is after the Korea War, until the reform of Social Security and Medicare, the federal government collected 15.3% of GDP from every form of taxes and they sent, spent 16% of GDP. On average was a 70 basis point deficit, but the economy was growing 3% a year, so the mathematics says it was sustainable. Fair enough? Second, second was from the reform of Social Security and Medicare to right as the crisis begins, the federal government spent 20.7% of the economy, they collected 17.7% of the economy. The deficit was 3%. And you know what? It wasn't great, but as long as the economy grew by 3%, it was sustainable mathematically. Fair enough? And now, since the beginning of the financial crisis, the federal government has spent 23.5% of the economy and collected 15.2%. To have an 8 0.3% of GDP gap, can you do it for a year? Of course. Can you do it for two years? Of course. Three, if you're rich. Four, if you're really rich. Five, if you're really, really rich. Fortunately, we're really, really rich. Greece wasn't. Cyprus wasn't. They could only do it for a year or so. It is not sustainable mathematically. Everybody knows it's not sustainable mathematically. And everybody knows something has to be done. The only problem is no one knows what. So everybody assumes their ox is going to be the one that gets gored, and people do less. This will eventually be dealt with, and as it is, it will reduce uncertainty. Next, these are interest rates over my life. Not quite. I'm making myself three years younger here than I really am. This is from 1954 to the present. The red is the Fed funds rate. And the yellow is the 10-year Treasury yield. 10-year Treasury yield, even after doubling, think about this. Even after doubling, the 10-year Treasury yield is at a historic low. And the long, excuse me, and the short-term interest rate has never been this low, much less this low for five years. How many of you believe that the next five years will be a zero short-term interest rate and a 25 to 3% 10-year? I mean, really believe it. 
Not some kind of bullshit believe it, really believe it. And the answer is nobody. Nobody. Now, let's do a harder question. How many have a clear vision of what it will be five years from now? And the answer is nobody. Eventually, we're going to know what happens when the Fed allows interest rates to go where they should be. And by the way, one of the hardest things about this interest rate environment, I know the major hedge fund guys, I know the major private equity guys, I know the major REITs, I know the major real estate entrepreneurs, and the one thing I know is none of them really know how to invest in that environment because they've never done it before in their life. They'll pretend they know, but they really don't know. And so I'll give you one other secret. How many saw The Wizard of Oz? You know, and the guy behind the curtain with the ring just, he was a traveling salesman. I know the guys on the Fed. And they're back there pulling levers behind the curtain, doing their damnedest to help. But do you really think they know? Come on, they're just DNA. I've been on faculties with these guys. I've been on committees with these guys. Trust me, it's not all inspiring. There's the Stinky Johnson phenomena. Do you know what Stinky Johnson phenomena is? Okay, when I was growing up, there was a kid in every neighborhood named Stinky Johnson. And he was a doofus, right? Kind of tripped over himself and always in. You know, he was the one who, when he swung the baseball bat, hit himself in the head, and you got the picture, right? You do not want to look up as you're being wheeled down the corridor of a major medical center on the way to open heart surgery and see Dr. Stinky Johnson looking down at you, saying, I think this surgery is going to go just fine. That's the Fed. Nine Stinky Johnsons. Doing the best they can. By the way, if you think the Fed knows, why do their models have bigger prediction errors than anybody else's models? If they really knew what to do, why did they wait so long to do it? So, let me go to the final uncertainty in that regard. This is the base money supply created by the Fed since 1959, and in 1959, there was just under $100 billion that the Fed had created. Over the next 50 years, actually 49 years, over the next 49 years, they created $600 billion. Okay, got it? Started at 100, 50 years grew $600 billion, and in the next six months grew by a trillion. This sounds like a John Daly routine. Nobody would believe it. A trillion in six months from a base of 700 billion. You think they, and then you know what it did over the next uh, 18 months? Grew by another trillion, and then it's grown by another trillion. The money supply is almost five times larger today than on September 1st, 2008. Do you think? anybody knows what happens when that occurs. And on what history would they base that knowledge? That's a huge uncertainty. And again, some do it intellectually, some do it viscerally. The one answer every economist would have given you at the beginning of 2007, if you'd have done a simple question of what happens if the monetary base increases fivefold in five years, and the one answer would have been, Rampant inflation. So much for that one. Oops. Now, what's happened is the Fed starts, quote, tapering. They've reduced it to only expanding at $700 billion a year. Remember, they took 50 years to create $700 billion. So they've slowed it to the rate that over the next 12 months they'll do it. That's the slowing. And the way to view this is no one knows, including the Fed. By the way, if the Fed knew, why did they wait this long to expand the money supply by that much? 
If they would have thought it took 3.5 trillion, why did they just do it September 29th, 2008? Now the interesting thing is this money has not gone into the banking system, it's gone to 12 banks. So when you go back to your old money and banking book and all the little banks and they got their money and they lent to little Mary Smith to buy her this and that, it's not what it's been. 12 banks have gotten but basically $3 trillion injected into them. Now, the reason we haven't gotten inflation is that money has not come out to users. It's sat in the banks primarily. It has sat in the banks and what hasn't sat in the banks has gone into what 12 banks, not the 3,400 banks in the country, the 12 banks have decided to do. So let me give you a thought experiment. Suppose the Fed, instead of giving that $3 trillion to 12 banks, had given that $3 trillion to 16-year-old teenage boys. Do you think the price of pornography would have gone up a lot? Because what do teenage boys want to buy? I don't know how to break this to you, Mom, but it's true. Um, so what has gone up in price? What's gone up in price is anything those 12 banks decide to do with their money. Not what the banking system decides, but what 12 banks. And those 12 banks are subject to a lot of scrutiny. Good news. Good news is the consumer has massively deleveraged. They've massively deleveraged. They're at the most low level of debt service they've probably been in 40 years. I only show this back 20 some years, but it's 40 some years. You know how consumers primarily lowered their debt burden? They did it the old fashioned way real estate guys do. They just said, I don't know you anymore. Right? It's one this group understands really well. That was the main way. It wasn't the only way, but it was the main way they reduced their debt burden. So the household is in good shape that way. Let me go across the real estate sectors, just very quickly journeying around. Um, this is construction of office space in real dollars. That is, I've netted out inflation. And the green shows the upper it's ever been. Uh, the red shows it's the lowest. And you can see in real dollars, we're not producing anything. Office construction is still below any time it's been on previous downs. By the way, is that consistent with what you know? And the answer is, yeah. Very muted. Office demand is still a bit muted. Why is office demand muted? Office demand is muted because we lost 9 million jobs during the recession and we've only added back 7.7 .7 million jobs. So we're still a million three short. A million three short means that that's the number of jobs we lose in a typical recession. We have just gotten to the point where you would expect the office market to react as it does coming out of a typical recession. So why has office demand been muted in most places? Not Houston, not Dallas, but in most places because it's still at recessionary norms. I expect a big pickup there as we add jobs back. Office vacancy rate. This is the office vacancy rate over time. The red is a forecast. You can see that the decline has been very muted. But it's been muted because when we lost 9 million jobs, a lot of them were just empty desks. They weren't just businesses going out of business. They were everybody had empty space. We have to fill the empty space. We have to get back to a normal recovery dynamic before you see it. And by the way, some studies we're doing right now show that once markets get to about 70 to 80% of the jobs they lost being recovered, that's when you see office absorption in that market really pick up. And, and we just hit that on a national. This is the same thing for industrial space, real construction. Industrial activity is about average. Industrial construction is about average, heavily port driven. Interesting fact people don't know, 
is you hear this claim, the United States doesn't make anything people want. The United States in real terms has never had higher exports than today, never. And it's not just fracking and, you know, it's everything. Okay, so the United States is a major exporter at this point. Um, that's been, and then also the, the online related logistics has been. But by the way, still very under control, very normal. Same chart on vacancy. You can see the vacancy came down dramatically for industrial space, warehouse space, and that will continue. It's not going to get as low as I show here because uh, the construction side will pick up as you get to the tail of that. But construction is still pretty muted. Very strong pickup. Some markets more than others. Let me go to the next. This is multifamily construction. Just about average. Remember, I've taken out inflation here. Just about average multifamily construction. Nowhere near peak, nowhere near cyclical peaks. Um, multifamily starts have increased by fivefold from the bottom. That's because starts at the bottom were 80,000 a year. We were destroying 170,000 units a year. So we had three years where the absolute stock of multifamily was shrinking. So yes, it's a five-fold increase from one-fifth of normal to normal. This sector, remember, is underproduced by a million units over the last decade. You're going to see real rents rise to an all-time historic high because they're not going to be able to produce fast enough to keep rents from outrunning inflation. Now, eventually they will. But in the next couple of years, you're going to see it continue. Multifamily vacancy rates have come down, will continue to come down. This is census data. If you use um, uh, institutional quality like NACREF, it's even a more dramatic picture. Remember there is the underproduction of a million units. Retail. This is retail construction activity in real terms, and it's flatline. Flatline. There's basically no new retail underway any place. The only construction that's going on in retail is just slight expansions of strong properties. Um, that doesn't look like it'll change in the foreseeable. The vacancy rate is still quite high. Yes, it's come down, but it's still quite high. So don't expect to see much construction until that vacancy falls another two, three hundred uh, basis points in uh, the market. Lodging. Lodging is an interesting chart. There are some people who will try to convince you that lodging didn't overbuild. I don't know what data they're looking at. But that peak that occurred was a pretty peaked peak in 2006, 7, and 8. By historic standards, this again is the construction activity. It was a massive overbuilding. It fell. Um, it's still got a distance back, but it's kind of close to normal. However, most of the construction that's going on in uh, hotel data, you got to look very careful, 22% of the existing stock of a hotel in Manhattan is currently out of the ground. 22%. Now think about that from a dollar point of view. That means in the next three years, there's going to be a 22% expansion of the hotel stock in Manhattan. That's a pretty stunning increase. If you go to the rest of the country, much more muted. Yes, it's picked up, but much more muted. And occupancy rates, not back to peak, still have a distance to go. They're going to fall in Manhattan in most other markets. They're going to continue to rise. Let me just stop and say that think about what happens in a world where construction is average to below average. We get some certainty on the environment we operate in. And you get an increase of economic activity that starts reverting towards that mean. And the deviation is everything spent in the United Kingdom. That's a world that could be pretty fun to be around. Even if it takes six years or eight years to occur, 
that could be a world that's pretty fun to be in. Um, and if I'm wrong, I'll be in good company because I'll be just like everybody at the Fed. Thank you. Let me stop and I'll maybe take two questions or something like that. Yeah? Questions, comments? The only thing I'd ask is don't start your question about could you say something about because the answer to that is I can say something about everything. So the answer to that is yes. Let's start here. Yeah, I'll repeat. If, if I, the question is, out of the six, what would be the one or two that I think are the most important of? Is that a fair way to say? Um, I think the two are real simple. Uh, one is, they're all important, but if I had to pick, the first is the drag being placed by Dodd-Frank clarification. I use that word loosely. But that we've told that entire sector Remember, that's the lubricant for the economy. So we've told every lubricant provider of the economy, we're totally changing you, but we've only told you to date 40% of the changes we are yet to do. Tell us 100%, and let's get on with it. That would be the number one, and only because it's so ubiquitous that it affects every business. And uh, the second would be if the Fed stopped believing their God. That's simple. Um, the Fed, by the way, I don't mean they're poorly intended. They actually believe they know better than markets. Because they're not letting markets establish prices for money. And the interesting thing is if you went to those economists that are on those members of the Fed and you said to them, do you believe markets should generally set prices? They'd all say yes. And then you'd say, well, why don't you let it establish the price of money and risk? And they would say, we know better. I've met them. All right, Ron? How does technology uh, affect demand for space? Uh, retail with the substitution and uh, office probably being the most notable too. Um, so far, I think people have misunderstood the office part. Time will tell. I'm old enough, you're old enough as well to remember every downturn, uh, major users of space reduce the space per worker when they renew lease. And they always have a statement of, this is the new way. And then once the labor market gets strong, remember, we still have a recessionary labor market. Unemployment rate is still at a typical recession level. The number of jobs we lost are still at a typical recession low. Okay? Three years after a typical recessionary bottom, all that's out the window, all that space saving. And the reason is, Think of a normal office. Don't even think of New York, right? Just think of a normal office market, uh, 30 bucks per foot. Okay, just 30 bucks per foot. And you're using 200 feet per worker. If that person is productive, you're spending basically nothing on them to provide space. By the way, the differential is not the full 200, right? It's maybe 100 versus 200. So you're talking 100 bucks excuse me, 100 feet times two, talking $2,000 a year. That's sending them to a bullshit local convention. <laughs> Not even a good one, right? If it comes to an environment of retaining and attracting workers, they loosen space usage. If I don't have to to retain workers, they tighten up. And my view is as we come out of normal recession into a normal recovery phase of a labor market, they're going to soften up that way. Now it'll take a few years. 
So I'm not as concerned as some of that technology. Technology historically has changed how we use space, not so much how much space we use. Now, this could be a new time. On the retail side, it's interesting that we've not had a shrinkage in bricks and mortar sales. Bricks and mortar sales today are essentially, in real terms, the same as they were in 2008. All the increase in retail sales, though, have been through internet. Okay, that's the thing. So does it affect things? Yes, but it doesn't affect them quite the way I think most people think. The problem is retail is a thin margin business. And if you change my margin, think of a business that's a 5% net margin. And if I change it by one, by 100 basis points, it's a 20% change. It's the, it's the differential, right, to the bottom line that you've got to make the adjustment. That's the ripple effect. So, and the other thing is they sign long-term leases, right? So they have these long-term obligations. I'm not as worried. I mean, it's still being worked out. I'm not as worried. It's interesting. I was on a panel run back in, I don't know, November or something, and the conversation was, what was the biggest change in retail over the last 15 years? And two of the three people made the comment, technology, internet, and so forth. And I said, it's not close. The internet isn't even close to the biggest change in retail in the last 15 years. 15 years ago, Walmart had no grocery sales. Today, they have a third of every dollar spent on grocery. That's dramatic because it meant that Walmart basically put in place enough space to sell a third of all the groceries in America on top of the retail space that already existed. So I'm not minimizing, I'm not minimizing the uh, technology part. I'm just saying sometimes we lose sight of the fact that there are just these fundamental changes. And retail, as you know, I kind of learned retail from Al Taubman, and one of the things I learned was it is not a sec it has never been a sector of stability. It's always been a sector of change. Where 20 years later, the names that were once strong, most people don't even know of anymore. And I'm struck by the fact Al Taubman opened uh, Woodfield Mall in suburban Chicago, probably one of the great, you know, fortress malls in America. And when he opened it, his tenants that got it financed were Wards, Montgomery Wards, Sears, Pennies, and Marshall Fields. Two are gone, one is almost gone, and one struggles. And that was a blue chip lineup in 1974, 40 years ago. That was a blue chip lineup. Now, and so I think it's, we underestimate how dynamic that sector has always been. You want to take one more or am I done? One more. Okay, make it easy. I wonder how much you lost compared to the scenario that I asked you about the SNL stock. Uh, I don't remember how it was going to be covered. And you had more success than the other two as you thought that was going to occur. Um, the question is how would I compare the damage from the, RT, uh, excuse, the uh, SNL crisis? late 80s, early a bit earlier in Texas, but the late 80s, early 90s, to this time and how it was dealt with then versus now. Um, I'm not a big proponent of large government programs because historically they're well intended and poorly executed. It's kind of like big bureaucracies in general. However, the one program in my life um, that was created and delivered more than I ever anticipated from it. So I don't include the military, which is always kind of around and being prepared, was the RTC. And I thought the RTC would be the greatest disaster ever, that it would be around today still. And as you know, it closed a year ahead of time. It was very efficient. It was quite effective. Minimal number of scandals that were associated with it. I think that was handled extraordinary. And I think the most telling phenomena about how the current crisis was mishandled, and I don't even claim to know how it should have been handled, was that I talked to two of the five directors of the RTC. Okay? 
And I asked them, this is a little dated. One of them has been dead for some time. This was a little dated. This I asked this within the first 12 months or so after the crisis. Did anybody call you and say, are there any lessons that we should take? Remember, there were five individuals who were directors of that. Nine, I can guarantee you two of the five. No one from Congress, no one from Treasury, no one from the White House ever called them. And these are major people, right? These were major, they're not like they're invisible folk. And I think that that's a big commentary on how things went as awry, is that you didn't turn to people who had more expertise in crisis management, not the, all the answers, but wouldn't you have thought you'd have looked to people who had handled a crisis pretty effectively, and if I told you they didn't call them, one was a Democrat, by the way, one was a Republican, so it wasn't a party issue. It's not heartwarming. Huh? So with that, go Gators. I don't often get associated with a number one basketball team. So thank you for having me. Note that we are running uh, a little bit behind schedule, so we'll begin uh, the next event within five minutes here. <laughs>